I'm Leo Torres. I'm a PhD candidate currently on my fifth year at the Network Science Institute. Today I'm going to show you two things. First, what happens to the leading eigenvalue of the non backtracking matrix when a node is removed from the graph? And second, how to use this knowledge to define a notion of node centrality and use it for the application of node immunization. But before all that, let me convince you that you shouldn't at all care about this matrix and its eigenvalue. Say you have the graph on the left with m edges. Then its non-backtracking matrix B will have 2m rows and 2m columns, so 2 rows and 2 columns per edge. This matrix is a transition matrix of a random walker that does not trace backtracks. That is, it never traverses the same edge twice in succession. For example, going from the red node to the blue node and back to the red node is a backtrack, and that is exactly what we're trying to avoid. Say there is a random walker that does not trace backtracks that just moved from the red node to the blue node. Then the matrix will have a row for the directed edge from red to blue and a column for the directed edge from blue back to red. The corresponding entry will be zero, meaning that the walker cannot go back to where it came from, whereas other entries will be one for any other valid step. For example, from red to green, sorry, from blue to green or blue to yellow. The eigenvalues of these metrics have multiple applications. For example, they have been discussed in terms of length spectrum theory, community detection, graph distance, graph embedding. They have already been used in the past to define node centrality. But let me focus on this last application. It is known that 1 over the leading eigenvalue lambda is a good approximation of the epidemic threshold of certain kinds of spreading dynamics, like the SIR model, for example. Remember that the higher the threshold, the more difficult it is for a disease to become an epidemic. So we would like to make the threshold as high as possible, and thus the eigenvalue as small as possible. Which leads us directly to the main question that we're dealing with here. What happens to the eigenvalue, and thus to the epidemic threshold, when a node is removed from the graph? In general, the eigenvalue will decrease, but we want to quantify by how much so that we can choose which node to remove if we're in a node removal or node immunization kind of setting. So let's get right into it and see how we can come up with an answer. First, let me write down some notation. In this graph, I will try to remove the node labeled as C, which I will call the target node. And I will color all of the edges that are not incident to C in blue, while all of the edges that are incident to C are in yellow. After removing the target node, I get the graph on the right. Now, we're going to use symbols with the superscript C to refer to the graph before the removal, while every symbol without the superscript corresponds to the graph after the removal of the target node. Essentially, what we're asking here is what is the difference between lambda 1 C and lambda 1? Let's start with the graph before the removal and let's arrange the rows and columns of its non backtracking matrix so that the blue edges, those that are not incident to the target node, from a block at the top left, and the yellow edges from a block at the bottom right. We're going to label the blocks as B, D, E, and F, and note that the blue block B at the top left is exactly the non-backtracking matrix of the graph after the removal, since by definition it depends only on the edges that are left intact. With these blocks, we define one more matrix X as D times F times E. This matrix turns out to also be a binary matrix that indicates the existence of non-backtracking paths of length 4 of the type blue, yellow, yellow, blue. These are exactly those paths that are destroyed when the target node is removed. So in the top left block B, we have the structural information that is kept after the removal, while X contains the structural information that is destroyed. Using this setup, we can now focus on trying to solve this equation. By definition, the solutions to this equation are the eigenvalues of the matrix BC. I will give a quick overview of the steps involved, so for more details, please see our paper. First, I'm going to apply a well-known formula for the determinant of a block matrix, which, after some massaging and some improving some lemmas, will look like this. Now, in this formula, I'm going to focus on the third term on the far right here, which depends on the matrix Y, which is defined in the bottom left of my slide, and also on the matrix X, which is defined in the previous slide. 
The point here is that if I make this third term equal to zero, then the whole thing equals zero, and I will have found one of my eigenvalues. So this is what I'm trying to solve now. And what I'm going to do is linearize this equation and neglect all of the small terms. The leading term here involves the trace of y times x. But the trace is nothing more than the sum of the diagonal entries, which can be written as this. These terms now involve ui and vi, which are the right and left eigenvectors corresponding to lambda i. Now from these terms, I will take only the first one, since all others are small as well. And I'm going to, fo to forget about all of those small terms and focus on the terms in the orange box. I'm going to set all of this equal to zero and rearrange to finally arrive at this expression. And now I'm done, because this is a third degree polynomial on the variable t, which can be solved using a closed formula. However, we can do even better, because the value of the constant term will determine the solution. If this constant term is large, then the solution is large, and if it is small, then the solution is small. And that means that in order to estimate what happens to the eigenvalue after removing the target node, we do not really need to actually estimate the eigenvalue, we just need to estimate this term. That's why we define this term as the x non backtracking centrality, or xnb, of the target node. In the paper, you will find another procedure that establishes that the xnb centrality is upper bounded, as shown here, where the terms in the three dots can also be neglected. Here we focus on this term, which is not only an upper bound, but also happens to be correlated to the x and b centrality, and so we call it the x degree centrality. By the way, all our derivations are valid on any graph without restriction on their structure. In particular, we are not making the assumption of absence of short cycles, or the graph being locally tree-like that is frequent in other derivations. In fact, the X matrix will be denser the larger the clustering coefficient of the target node is. So the short cycles, or at least the triangles, are already being taken into account here. So let me real quick go back to our main question. What happens to the eigenvalue when you remove a node? It decreases by a quantity that is correlated to the X and B centrality. How correlated? Very correlated. Here in the vertical axis, you have the true change in the eigenvalue after removing a node, and on the horizontal axis, you have the x and b centrality of that node. Each marker on the plot is a randomly chosen node from a randomly generated graph in the stochastic block model. And as you can see, there is a strong correlation, and the same pattern is repeated for other kinds of graphs. Yes, the degree is also related to the change in the eigenvalue, but the correlation between x and b and the eigenvalue is much stronger, in some cases going up all the way to almost 1. So let's talk a little bit more about these centrality measures and see how they can be used for node immunization. First, let's talk about how to compute them efficiently. Up to now, everything we've done depends on having fixed the target node. So if you fix the target node and rearrange the matrix, you can define the x matrix and then compute the centralities and so on. Here, by the way, I'm using the subscript C in the X matrix to highlight the fact that if you choose a different target node, the matrix X will be different. With this matrix and the eigenvectors, you can compute the X and B like this. But if you rewrite this equation in scalar form, you will find this formula, where the A's now come from the adjacency matrix, and the V's are the standard non-backtracking centralities of each node which is another centrality measure that was defined years ago. So to compute the x and b of all nodes at the same time, you do not really need to rearrange the matrix each time and then compute a different x matrix each time. You can just compute the vector of standard non-backtracking centralities of all nodes and re-aggregate them using this equation. So computing the x and b of all nodes is not more costly than computing one eigenvector and re-aggregating its entries. The same can be said for x degree. This is the original definition, and this is a scalar form, where now these coefficients v prime are nothing more than the degree of the node minus 1, also called the excess degree. And they are being aggregated in exactly the same way as the standard non-backtracking centralities were aggregated in the previous formula. 
This is why our centralities are called the X non backtracking and the X degree centralities, because they start from these more standard centrality measures that are then aggregated using the X matrix. Let's talk about the application to node immunization. This is a procedure where you are removing nodes one by one according to their centrality in order to decrease the leading eigenvalue as much as possible. The table that I'm going to show you presents the percentage decrease of the eigenvalue, so larger is better, averaged over repetitions in different kinds of synthetic random graphs after removing one, two, or three percent of the, their nodes using many different centrality measures. Here, NS is the net shield algorithm, and CI is the collective influence centrality, which is yet another centrality measure also based on the non backtracking matrix. These are the results where you can see that degree is actually a very strong baseline for this task and that our X centralities are in general slightly better than the others, especially in these kind of random graphs, though the difference is statistically significant in all cases. Let me now focus on a case study that we found very interesting. We're going to run the same experiment as before, but now on different kinds of real networks. And I'm going to show you the percentage decrease of the eigenvalue after removing only one node. So the, removing the, the node with largest degree or largest CI or largest X degree. And I want to draw your attention to the transportation network. Here in the first network, removing the node of largest degree or largest CI has zero impact on the eigenvalue while X degree is actually effectively identifying a node that will impact the eigenvalue and reduce it by 0.65%. Now in the second network, none of these three centralities can identify the right node. If you remove 10 nodes, in the second network, X degree is now able to identify some effective nodes, while degree and CI are still struggling, still at zero performance. And if you remove 100 nodes, then CI starts to catch up, though it does not perform as well as X degree, and degree is not able to get there yet, even after 100 nodes. So while in general, on the average, you get only a slight performance boost using our centralities, there are some cases like this one where there is a world of difference. Let me make a quick comment about our algorithm. In general, when you remove a node, sorry, when you remove one node at a time, you have to recompute the centralities of all nodes again after each time you remove one of them. Unless you have a clever way of updating the centrality values of all nodes without having to start from scratch. Now, we do not have this for the X and B centrality. The reason is that we do not yet really know how the removal of a node will affect the eigenvector, which is necessary to recompute the X and B. However, in the case of X degree, we do know how to do this. So in this slide, you're looking at the runtime of this algorithm with the fast updating after each removal as applied to synthetic random graphs generated from the configuration model drawing from a power load degree distribution. An interesting finding here as we were implementing this is that you can implement the same algorithm using two different data structures, a hash map or dictionary or an indexed priority queue or IPQ. What's interesting here is that which is the faster version actually depends on the actual structure of the graph. And we can tell you exactly which one to use based on the level of heterogeneity of the degree distribution. In the paper, we provide all details of these derivations and we have made code publicly available that implements both versions as well. So I just want to finish by pointing out a few interesting properties that we think are good lines of future research. Let's take the scalar formula of X degree as an example. Like I said, this depends on my neighbor's excess degrees. But now let's compare this to minus the variance of my neighbor's excess degrees. These are almost the same formula, except, that, except for the normalization terms in the orange boxes. Now, compare this also with the collective influence centrality that I was using in my experiments before. The CI is also defined in terms of my neighbor's excess degrees, but now it is proportional to a linear combination of them. So it is a function of the first moment rather than the variance. So my question here is, what happens with the higher moments of my neighbor's excess degree distribution? 
Perhaps there is something that both CI and X degree are missing. Or perhaps there is another matrix somewhere out there that will care about the third or the fourth moment of my neighbor's degree distribution. And if so, I would love to know what that is. And I would love to know how all these pieces fit together. Now let's talk about localization. It is known that the principal eigenvector of the adjacency matrix is localized on nodes of large degree. This means that nodes of large degree have disproportionately high eigenvector centrality when compared to all others, which is bad news if you are trying to meaningfully rank all of the nodes in your network and not only the large hubs. And in fact, the standard non back tracking centrality was first proposed as a way to avoid this localization. However, it is now known that the standard non back tracking centrality does localize in some other kinds of subgraphs or motifs. For example, on a click or near click, or on a subgraph with Poisson degree distribution, provided that the average degree is high enough, or on this motif here on the far right called overlapping hubs, where the red nodes have high degree and are connected to uh, all of the blue nodes. Something that all these have in common is that the neighbors of the red nodes have very little variance in their degrees, and therefore the red nodes have very high de sorry, the red nodes have very high x degree. So one thing I would love to know is if we can come up with another motif or subgraph or some kind of structure or even a generative model that generates a subset of nodes with high x degree. My bet is that we will find an eigenvector localized on those nodes with high x degree. I haven't tested this hypothesis yet, but if anyone is interested, I think this is a nice opportunity for collaboration. So to recap real quick, the leading eigenvalue decreases by an amount that is correlated to the x and b centrality when you remove a node from the graph. We have developed here new techniques to analyze the non backtracking matrix. I give a quick overview here, but there is much more detail in the paper, and there are many interesting open questions there as well. Using the x centrality to remove nodes in order to decrease the eigenvalue is slightly better in general, but substantially better in some cases, like transportation networks, for example. And there are many interesting open questions here that could be the source of future collaborations. This paper is under review, and you can check out the preprint on the archive. And the code is also available online. I want to acknowledge and thank my collaborators, Kevin Chan from the Army Research Lab, Hang Hang Tong from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and my advisor, Tina elias -Irad. Finally, I wanted to finish by saying that I am currently looking for a position as a postdoc or assistant professor. So if you know of any opportunities, please let me know. Thanks.